Well, good morning, church. Good to see you all here today, ready to hear God's word. Um, as I always ask, if you don't mind, if you have a hard copy of your Bible, have that with you. If you have it on your phone or iPad or whatever, have that at your side, because I'm going to be referring to the passage quite a few times this morning, so it will just help you keep track of where we're going. So in today's gospel reading that we just read, we have this standoff between a Jew and a Gentile. Jesus and this woman, we don't know her name, they come head to head in this very, very confrontational, it's almost like a verbal fencing match. It's a very suspenseful and surprising encounter between two strangers. And if we're honest, even Jesus says some very shocking things in this passage. Now, we won't go too heavy and too deep, but just to start with, I want you to track with me here. As we read this story, let's notice that Matthew, you know, the gospel writer who's writing this, He's dropping a few textual hints for us, clues to help us understand what he's doing. So let's do a little bit of exegesis together, and let's see what Matthew's trying to draw our attention to. Now, immediately, straight off the bat, we read that Jesus is in the region of Tyre and Sidon. You heard of these places? Well, let me tell you, not just two random places. These are Gentile cities in the area of Phoenicia, and these two cities are frequently the object of condemnation by the Old Testament prophets. The object of condemnation because of their repeated idolatry, their Baal worship, their arrogant materialism. So Tyre and Sidon, that means something to us as readers. Secondly, notice that Jesus is not on a mission to preach to the Gentiles. Not at this point. Jesus has simply come to the area. Notice it says Jesus has come to the, to the region, not to the cities themselves. Jesus has come to the region. Why? To have respite from the scribes and the Pharisees, the guys who have been giving him hassle, the guys who have been opposing him so far. So, in other words, Jesus is here in this area. He's here to enjoy some quiet time away from the crowds and the multitudes when this very flustered woman runs up to him pleading for help for her demon-possessed daughter. And the last biggest hint that Matthew gives us is in this woman's ethnicity. Did you pick up on that? She's a Canaanite. Some of your versions might say Syrophoenician. She's a Canaanite. Now, obviously, if you know anything about your Bibles, this racial identification is more than just casual storytelling. Canaanites were the most persistent and the most insidious of all of Israel's enemies. The Canaanites were the ones who, who Israel had warred with throughout almost the whole of the Old Testament. The Canaanites were the thorn in Israel's side. If the Canaanites weren't completely wiping out the Israelites, they were leading them into pagan worship, leading them into sinful, idolatrous practices. So when this Canaanite woman approaches Jesus, the disciples balk. And so would you if you were a first century Jew reading this text for the first time. So Matthew, what he's doing here, he's cleverly setting up this story to make us think, oh, let's keep this woman at arm's length. But she throws herself at Jesus' feet. She says, Kiri, Kiri, which means Lord, Lord, help me. See, on some level, even though she hasn't met Jesus before, on some level, she knows this man is the Son of God. But now, the real shock takes place. Something that should concern people who expect Jesus to be the all-loving, all-compassionate, all-embracing guy that he is. 
Jesus rebukes the woman and he rebukes her plea. He says, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which was to some degree true. Jesus had come to help the Jews, and so far, his whole ministry had taken place entirely in Galilee. Jesus says to the woman, in effect, I'm not here for you. And then it gets worse. To add insult to injury, Jesus tells her, it's not fair to take the children's food and give it to dogs. Now, you probably know that the Jews often referred to the Gentiles as dogs, and this wasn't in some cute way that we often think about small dogs now. This was in a very pejorative sense. Jesus reminds her that the children, who are the Jews, that the children are in a position of, of right and of privilege, but a position in which the dogs cannot hope to have any share. Jesus here is very offensive. Jesus here is very rude. Jesus here is kind of racist. So it would seem like there is no hope for this Canaanite woman. No hope for her sick daughter. But here is where the story turns. Bold, feisty, she refuses to accept Jesus' words. She will challenge him for her vindication. She will nag him for justice. Yes, Lord, she says, yet even the dogs get to eat some of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She says, I may be a non-Israelite. I, I may be a Gentile. You can even call me a dog, but even dogs get leftovers. Even I should receive grace. Such, such deep insight. Because this woman, maybe she doesn't even know this, but she has made a statement that encapsulates the theological message running throughout the whole of Scripture. The message is this. Israel was chosen by God, not from the world, but for the world couple of passages that spring to mind, which the guys might be able to get on the screen for us here. When God calls Abraham in Genesis 12, God says, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Uh, another passage that says the same thing in Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach just you, just your people. No, that my salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. You see... The grace extended to Israel was never supposed to be an exclusive grace, something to be grasped and held onto tightly. It was meant to be a blessing, and it was meant to be a light for the rest of the world. And so the Canaanite woman, she intuits this, and so she won't give up. Even I should receive grace. And now Jesus' whole demeanor changes. Woman, he says, great is your faith. You really get it, don't you? You really understand God's grace. Let your daughter be healed. And her daughter instantly is healed. So if you're anything like me, you've got a couple of questions about this text, right? It's a little bit confusing. Did the Canaanite woman change Jesus' mind? No. No. Is Jesus really that insensitive? No. Was Jesus being racist? Of course not. But what he does here is he deliberately challenges the woman in order to guide her into expressing her own deepest knowledge. 
And if you're a teacher, any teachers here, you'll know this kind of teaching technique. You know, sometimes when I teach guitar to people, I'll, deliver, I'll deliberately I'll play the wrong chord. I'll play the wrong notes just to see whether the student is listening and to see whether the student is noticing. And hopefully, it pushes the student into speaking up and challenging me, showing that they're getting it. And so in the same way, Jesus, as an expert teacher, chooses to debate with this woman in a very confrontational way. Why? In order to draw out her faith. And so far from being on the fringes of God's good grace, Jesus applauds her refusal to accept defeat, and he commends her for having great faith, something he doesn't say about anyone else in the entire gospel. So just a couple of points to leave you guys with today as we reflect on this passage. Firstly, and I mean this, stand up for yourself and recognize your worth because God has given you, yes, even a wretch like you, amazing grace. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't deserve grace because you do. And now that the grace has been extended to you, what are you supposed to do with it? Give it away. Give it away. As we've seen, Israel was chosen not to keep grace for herself, but to bless the rest of the world with it. In the same way, you all have been saved not from the world, but saved for the sake of the world. As the Canaanite woman reminds us here, we're all dogs, aren't we, a lot of the time? Undeserving, sinful, deliberately going against God's will for our lives. Yet we still receive crumbs. We still get to be recipients of his grace. So we go out there and we share those crumbs with other people. You see, grace... Grace is one of those paradoxical gifts. The more you give it away, the more you become enriched yourself. You know, I think of a story like the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples are nervous, right? Because they only have, uh, what do they have? They have uh, five loaves and two fish. How are we going to feed all these people, they say? What does Jesus say? Give it away. Just give it away. What about us? Well, somehow there's enough bread and enough fish for 5,000 people and 12 baskets left over. Why 12? One for each of the disciples. Much more than they even began with. Extend love, extend forgiveness and grace to others and do it recklessly and do it generously. And God promises that your own life will be enhanced. Lastly, one more thing that I think this Canaanite woman teaches us today. Nag God. Persist with God. Be bold in telling God what needs to happen. I think we get nervous sometimes about expressing our true feelings to God, as though somehow he's going to be offended at us or something like that. But that's not what we find in the Bible at all. Think of the Israelites in slavery crying out to God to rescue them, to release them. And God hears their groaning. He remembers his covenant promise and he delivers them. Or think of one of, well, one of many of David's Psalms saying repeatedly things like, I call upon you, Lord. Come quickly to me. Listen to my voice when I call you. The biblical authors won't let God off the hook so easily. They nag him for justice to be done. Just like the Canaanite woman insists that Jesus listen to her cause and bring justice to her. And it works. 
So guys, whatever it is that you're going through right now, I really want to encourage you to pray. Pray with zeal. Pray with passion. Pray with boldness. Pray with heart. Obviously not praying for silly, frivolous things, but praying that justice would be done. Justice for yourself, justice for this church, justice for the world. And again, it's not so much that we're convincing God to care. It's not like that. But here's the thing. When we nag God, when we nag God, it means that we're still hoping, we're still trusting, we're still expecting God to act. So when our world and our country is so broken, as we've seen in Charlottesville, in Barcelona, there's something important about having to nag God because it reminds us that we still care. So friends, I hope that you dare to pray with the same courage as the Canaanite woman. Stand up for your own dignity. Stand up for your own worth. Understand that grace is this endless gift that you can share generously with other people and continue to nag God that his justice will be done in the world. Amen.